Hi, and you're very welcome to episode 15 of the League of Ireland podcast here on Final Whistle. I. My name is Brett Finnerly, and once again, I am joined by Longford Town Captain Dean Zambra for the next uh, 50 minutes or so as we chat through the action from last weekend, preview some of this weekend's games, double round in the Premier Division, of course, uh, and also we have a little chat with Dean's mini-me, for want of a better word, his teammate in Longford, A. Durman, will be joining us for a bit of a chat about how Longford season has gone but also what it's like being a local in a team that's predominantly made up of Dublin-based players. Uh, Dean, of course, you're one of those Dublin-based players. Uh, you've had a couple of days off, mid-season break. Obviously, we put a show out uh, a week ago, but it was recorded at the start of the mid-season break. What's it like being back in the saddle, back at, at training? And, and did you get up too much for the week off? Uh, no, just had a couple of days break um, down a week low. But other than that, it was kind of just getting ready to come back into training really like and it, it goes really quick and then you're back in and we've done uh, three or four sessions like leading up to the to the Pats game so um, you're back in it pretty much straight away. I uh, talked to a couple of Pats lads and a couple of other lads around the league and like they were saying their schedules were similar like they had three and four days off and then they were back in and just preparing to go again and, and we're going from now to the end of the season really so. No international holidays in your world at the moment. I know one or two members of the league maybe got their hands slapped for uh, maybe breaking some rules. You didn't do get up to any such development. No, not unless Wicklow is off the charts uh, for people now. Like so, we, it wasn't that far away from home, only about twenty minutes. But um, yeah, no, I don't know about other players. Maybe chance around getting away. But uh, I think nearly all of our lads were well behaved, or all of them were well behaved, um, from what I know. So. Yeah, nice little correction there, nice catch. Uh, of course, Wicklow was within your five-kilometre uh, radius or parts of County Wicklow at certain times uh, over the last year. You've been always able to go to Wicklow, uh, so why wouldn't you on your week off? In terms of other stuff that's been happening outside of the league over the last couple of weeks, of course, we've had the, the rebranding or the relaunch of a new look watch, uh, not watch LOI, that's now consigned to history, LOI TV. Um, an interesting start. Uh, fairly partisan commentators, but overall a fairly positive step. You obviously were playing at the weekend. Uh, have you had a chance to look back at any games over that, or have you been too busy maybe watching the, I don't know, some other football competition that somebody told me is happening at the moment? Yeah, well, I've seen bits and pieces, and obviously try and get back and see uh, um, the highlight packages and things that the clubs are, are putting out as well. So, um, like you said, the uh, commentators are, quite, are maybe biased towards the, the home club, but like that can be a good thing, but it can I suppose can be a bad thing if you're watching in from the opposition side and you're you're constantly getting bombarded with one sided stuff. But um, yeah, no, I think it's a, a pretty good start. Uh, I think we're calling out for this kind of stream service for years, regardless of pandemic and that. So if this can be the birth of something that coincides with also having your fans in, but also having a stream service available for you know fans that can't make it or fans that are away from home or whatever the case may be so uh it's a bright start and hopefully we just keep building on it is the main thing going forward yeah i think once the uh the early kinks get ironed out it's going to be really really valuable for not just the league but the clubs and the supporters as well as you mentioned people who are for no fault of their own maybe outside the country on holidays whatever it might be will be able to follow their teams uh, on that fantastic new service. And I have to say, uh, it's a step up the new looks website. It's a vast improvement on what was there before from LOI TV. So uh, kudos to everybody involved in that from the FAI and uh, all the other players involved in player, I think, are the, the, com the company that are providing that service to the FAI and to the league. So uh, thumbs up for that fantastic work. Uh, we also might talk about uh, Bit of League of Ireland interest. Ireland, of course, got their first win under Stephen Kenny. Um, it took a while, a uh, bit of a scare along the way, but a good 4-1 win in Andorra uh, gets that ball rolling. And now we're looking at a, a two-game unbeaten run. Yeah, I, I questioned the motive for playing Andorra overall because uh, I think a couple of other pundits said something similar, like, what do you get from winning that game? Or what do you, you read into from winning it? And then if you did lose it or drop, you know, uh, or conceded a goal in the game and people are hammering us for it, or you draw the game against Andorra. But, you know, at the end of the day, you take the positives from it. It's four goals. It's a win. Um, it's a message you can bring back to the players then say, look, this stuff 
worked in this game and it resulted in wins and like three or four or five months down the line it might not be referring to the fact that it was played against Andorra it might just be that that was the first result that kick-started kind of people believing that the players more mainly believing that there's there's more there and we can we can do better and like I said maybe in a couple of months time we look back and say you know that's five of the last six they're unbeaten in or they've won three of the last four or whatever it might be and it won't really matter that it was Andorra at, at the very start. So, you know, goals were good. Win is good. And I don't think you take a huge amount more than that. You just try and, and, and keep rolling from there. Like, Yeah, of course, Troy Parrott's first two goals at senior level. Uh, Daryl Horgan got in the score sheet as well. And I think it was Kevin Knight got the fourth. Um, nice Jason. to see. Pardon? Jason Knight. Jason Knight, sorry. Kevin Knight is... Uh, yeah, uh, Jason Knight. Uh, so great uh, to see kind of three new names on the score sheet for Ireland and, and and a really nice brand of football as well that didn't change even when we went that goal behind. Yeah, exactly. Like, And the goals were quite well played. You know, we see a lot of... Um, I'm not going to compare them to kind of Barcelona or Manchester City type teams, but there's a lot of goals that kind of get put across the box and, and tapped into the net. And a couple of the goals were, were kind of of that ilk. So again, I'm not getting too high and saying and like we're great and we're brilliant and we're the same as those great football teams. But there was a, an element of that where there was good quality into the box and good quality finishing at the end. And like you can't blame the opposition on that. So that didn't matter in that context. It was just good that, that we got them. And particularly for Jason Knight, because I think he's definitely one of the players that will um be really important going forward. Like um to give us that type of player and that type of game plan and that type of style of play, he's going to be important. Absolutely. Let's turn our attention, I suppose, back towards the League of Ireland. And, of course, uh, you were in action after that mid-season break and you had a fairly tough task. Pats have been impressive so far this season. They were the visitors to Bishopsgate. 3-1 the final score. Uh, thoughts on the game? How did you feel? I suppose, obviously, disappointed to lose the game, but uh, your thoughts on how it went? Yeah, I think... Uh... Like we're disappointed, but we've also got to give credit to one of the best teams in the league who deserved to win the game on the day, played quite well. Um, you know, first half they were they were very good. They were a goal up and possibly could have been more. But I think the disappointment for us was we got back into it in the second half, played reasonably well for 10, 15 minutes and and got a goal um to get us back in and then you know, not not long after that, uh, we've made an error which gives a goal away and it goes to 2-1. And I think that takes the wind out of your sails then. And from that point on, I think we, we huffed and puffed and tried to muster up a, another effort to get back into the game, but just, just didn't have enough. And again, the third goal is a bit of quality, good ball into the box, great run, well-finished header. And, you know, when you're chasing games, as we have been at times this season, you take them sucker punches in the end and sometimes... Maybe the result looks worse than it actually was, but you know it was probably quite fair in the end um, to lose out three one. But you know we can't get too despondent because you're talking about one of the best teams in the league, and they, and they played some good stuff on the night as well. Of course, just for the record, Robbie Benson with that early goal in the first half, well, late in the first half, forty one minutes uh, for Pats to open the score and Aaron Dobbs with a penalty uh, early in the second before Maddie Smith just after the arrow mark, and Rona Cochran sealed the deal uh, with 10 minutes left on the clock in that game. Another game played on Saturday evening was the visit of Drogheda to the, sh to the showgrounds. Sligo Rovers, obviously, the hosts there. They were missing Gary Buckley and David Cawley. Romeo Parks out for suspension as well. Um, the, the lack of strength and depth, and I know we've touched on it uh, on the show with yourself and Alan over the last couple of months, it kind of showed for the first time this season against Sligo. Is that a worry going forward as they pick up maybe these five match, uh, five uh, yellow card suspensions going forward? They looked a little bit ordinary and they've been very impressive all season, but they just didn't look like they could deal with Drogheda at the at the game. I suppose two on the results and to turn it on its flip side, probably flattered Sligo in terms of how the game went. Drogheda never really looked like losing this. Yeah, well, I think myself and, and Keno and yourself talked about kind of players of the season and, and you know, I said Gary Buckley. So I think um, with him out, it, it said, you know, a lot about, about the team and that they just didn't look as solid, looked a little bit shaky. And like you mentioned, and I suppose Keno will know kind of more so or more in depth about the, the squad depth, but just taking two or three out. You know, whereas maybe you can cope with one being out or two being out, you know, that way. But if you've three or four out of the kind of 
first 12, 13 unit that you use on match days, then maybe you don't look as strong, you know, and you're coming into European games and things like that as well, where squads are going to get stretched. So um, I wouldn't be too worried about Liam because they're a good side and they're playing well. And, you know, they've they've established themselves as one of the better teams in the league. So um, he might look to bring in a player too, just to straighten up. Um, but not too worried. Like, I, I think they'll get back, you know, get back to win away is quick enough and regain that form. They haven't slipped too many times this season. So, you know, um, I expect them to kind of come back around and, and, and correct that right or correct that wrong from last weekend. Yeah, Chris Lyons with both draw the goals, one in each half, and then a consolation in injury time from a corner for Shane Blaney ahead of the just looped in over David Adamusu in the Drogheda goals. So uh, Sligo do stay second in the table, or sorry, drop to second in the table uh, by virtue of goal difference. Uh, and the reason for that is because Shamrock Rovers didn't manage to hold on to a 1-0 lead against Finn Harps. Won all the final score. Ollie Horgan will be delighted, although knowing Ollie, he probably won't be delighted. Uh, but it's it's an interesting uh, result. Finn Harps had started well. They dipped a little bit. But then an Adam Foley goal uh, brought them a point home from Tala at the weekend. They'll be delighted with that. Yeah, of course. Um, I think for Rovers, they're not quite blown teams away as we thought they might have done. And it's, you know, it's a grind for them a little bit. And they've ground out a couple of results, particularly against ourselves in, in injury time in two games. And um, I think Finn Harps will be thrilled that they they were the ones that would come back, get the equaliser and hang on then for the point, you know. And um, it's the first game back after the break as well. So maybe something that we said at the start of the season with Rovers was maybe it'll take them a little bit of time to find some rhythm. Um, so maybe they'll kind of gradually build up another little bit of rhythm here going forward. Um, I don't think they'll be overly concerned. Uh, the goal wasn't brilliant for their point of view, so they might kind of be a bit disappointed with the defending on that one. But, you know, it's a point and, you know, they're not for, like, well, obviously they're top of the table, so, like, they're not going to be too despondent about it, the point and they're, I'm sure they're just looking forward and, you know, hoping to pick up wins and, and kind of make that top spot their own in the next couple of weeks, like, you know. Yeah, a disappointing result on the night, but ironically enough to put them back on top of the table with the slip up in the showgrounds from Sligo. It was, of course, Aaron Green, his second of the season. He's not really prolific for scoring goals, but he's kind of central to everything Shamrock Rovers do on an attacking level. Yeah, he's a very good player and very dangerous player. And I think from his own point of view, he'll probably say he should maybe get a couple more per season or, you know, four or five more, which might make the numbers look you know, substantially better. But like you said, he's re very important to the team and maybe a little bit um, like that Roberto Firmino role for any Liverpool fans, like over the last couple of seasons where, you know, the manager really loved him, the coach loved him because he knitted everything together, but he probably wasn't getting a huge amount of goals from that position. So maybe a similar situation for Aaron there. But again, he's a player that you can't give chances to if you're an opposition team because he will score goals as well. Like it's not as if, he goes through seasons without scoring. Um, so, you know, from his point of view, he'll he'll want a couple more just to improve the numbers. But I'm sure um, I'm sure they're very happy with him at Rovers anyway. Yeah, of course. Another one-all draw uh, in the neighbours of Finn Harps, Derry City, the Brandywell, the location. Derry City host the Bohemians, one-all draw. Um, I, I don't know who's going to be more happy coming out of this, whether it's going to be uh, Bowes for the points that they kind of, I don't know, but Derry got to be the happier camp at the end of this. 94th minute, Mark Walsh pops up with an equaliser. They kind of got out of jail here. Yeah, and I think uh, Keith will be disappointed because it's the second time against Derry conceding late on and, and dropping points, you know. So um, he'd be disappointed having scored around 80, I think 81, 82, while he could have scored. So um, he'd be disappointed that they didn't see out the game from that point. Um it seemed to be quite an evenly balanced game. So maybe overall it wasn't an unfair result that, that Derry nicked one right at the very end. But um, when you're winning into that last minute of, of injury time, you obviously want to come out with the point. So I think Bowes will be a little bit more disappointed. Derry probably be a little bit more positive that they've kind of got a point in the last couple of minutes of a couple of games now. And they've gone on a little bit of a run as well. So I think Rory will be saying like, you know, fair play for getting back into the game, fair play for showing the character. And he'll use that as a motivation going forward that, that they're digging out these results. 
Yeah, I think uh, no matter what the score actually is, you score an equaliser in the 94th minute, it feels like a win uh, on the night. And until maybe you come and look at it in the cold light of day the following day, it feels like a victory, even if it only brings you the one single point. Final game, and probably a one I'm looking forward to talking about least, if I'm honest, is Dundalk and Waterford, because I, I don't know where you go with this. Dundalk, what, what, what do you talk about? What do you say about what's been going on in Dundalk for the last probably 6 to 12, maybe even 18 months. Patrick Hoban scored up just before the half-hour mark. It looked like it was going to be a fairly easy procession to three points for Dundalk. Their goal up against one of the teams that are struggling in the league this year. But Waterford hadn't read the script. John Martin, Shane Griffin, John Martin were again late on. 3-1 winners in Oriel Park. It took them off the bottom of the table. They passed yourselves out at the, the foot of the table. But Dundalk, like, how bad does it have to get? What's going on? I know you probably can't talk too much about it because you're an active player in the league, but supporters are, talk, are ripping their hair out. There's protests. The supporters groups been formed. Like, what? I I don't even know what to say. It's just where do you go to from? Where do you go to from here? Yeah, it's it's actually a little bit strange at this stage. Like bizarre. Like they've still got a very good squad of highly paid players for this league. You know, it's a big budget. It's, you know, full-time team, full-time outfit. But I think you can trace it back, like we said, maybe, you know, a year, 18 months or so here where you're seeing the cracks starting. Players weren't getting their contracts renewed, so it looked like they were going to go into this off-season with very few lads under contract. A number of their better players went to other League of Ireland clubs and are still doing well. Um, we didn't really understand the recruitment process in terms of going and getting, you know, half a dozen or more kind of foreign players that, you know, nothing wrong with that, obviously, and some of them have good quality, but sometimes you see that doesn't work out, and generally, you have to have a base of very good League of Ireland players to be very good in the League of Ireland. So, I think we didn't understand the recruitment process, and then since the season started, like, we were expecting it, okay, maybe it'll take a little bit of time to gel, but we'll see them being a really strong outfit, kind of, maybe five, seven games in, but it, it doesn't seem to have happened. I don't know whether there's a void in the camp, can't speak to that, you know, uh, being outside, but, um, you know, for the rest of the league, they were expecting Dundalk to challenge, you know, for the title or to be up around those European spots and, and they're not. Like, and even going back to Friday, I think a lot of people would have seen 1-0 up and said, OK, that's that's probably over and maybe didn't watch that game or, you know, took the eyes off. It. And then for Waterford to come back and win 3-1 was a big, big shock. And it doesn't do us any favours on two fronts. One, Waterford go ahead of us. And two, you've got the backlash now to deal with of Dundalk because I'm sure... You know, they'll be, they'll be, you know, if not ran, like in the old days, they'll be definitely motivated to, to come out and get a result this weekend. Of course, Waterford get that new manager bounce. Uh, Mark Bertram came into the club recently. So they're living off that. But, like, this is still the side that got beat 7-0 a few years, or weeks ago now, albeit with the COVID effect that a lot of players missed and couldn't feel the team against Sligo Rovers, uh, but have been disappointing all season and the fundamental body of players hasn't changed and they can go out and do that to a team of as you said well-paid professional players drawn from all over the continent I, I just can't understand it yeah well like i said i don't think that anyone in the league could and especially when you're seeing the the one nil goal for dundalk you're you're thinking this is going to be a, a fairly routine win but um maybe we maybe we shouldn't be shocked anymore at, at that kind of result and and that kind of game and like you said, a little bit of a new manager bounce for, for the Waterford lads and, you know, maybe a bit more confidence or maybe they're organised a different way. Maybe they just have more belief in kind of what they're doing. Or You, you, you can never really put your finger on that specific thing that goes right when a new manager comes in. But um, like I said, it, it seemed to knock us on two fronts that, you know, the team that wins goes ahead of us and the, the team that loses, we play the following week and we have to deal with the kind of backlash from that. But, you know, that's the league at the moment and that's just kind of how it goes well maybe let's have a chat with someone else who's in the exact same position as you are looking into that literally a uh, central midfielder for longford town let's have a little chat with your teammate Ader. now dean someone you're well used to spending a good bit of quality time with is your central midfield partner in longford a Irvin, of course uh, well known as the, the local boy in that squad in bishop's gate uh, a you're very welcome to the show Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Of course, you, you know 
Jane, you probably stream Jane more often than you see members of your family over the last couple of months. Um, I suppose we might as well start off by by talking about where Longford are in this in the league and, and how the season's going. Bottom of the table, of course, as we know, but I suppose came into it maybe with expectations have been around that space, at least from the outside of the camp. How have you found the the first three or four months of the of the season? Um, yeah, obviously the table doesn't say uh, or everything we've been competitive in in the majority of games, but sort of we're saying the same things most weeks now that it's just individual mistakes and stuff like that. But in the in the training and stuff like that, I think we're all we're all close, and you can ask Dino as well. We're all we're all still in high spirits. Uh, obviously, we'd prefer to be winning, but we know that we're competitive and we know that we're we're good enough, and hopefully, we just get a bit of luck now soon. Yeah, of course. Uh... Disappointing result at the weekend. St. Pat's in town, 3-1 the final score. How important is it to keep that scoreboard ticking over? Because there have been some impressive moments from Longford this year. I know we've spoken to Dean about some of them uh, earlier in, in the year, but like Dylan Grimes has been a revelation. You've made an impression this year in the league. Plenty of others have come out and kind of put their name forward and, and said I'm a Premier Division player and, and backed that up. Um What's been the biggest thing you've learned since you've come up to, to that level from the first division over the last few seasons? Um, I think how clever uh, players are. You know, you're playing in the first division where people are units more than anything and they're fit and they'll press the life out of you. Where in the Premier Division this year, they're actually smarter in a way where they won't press you as much. If you, you've seen our results and stuff like that, if you make mistakes, they'll, they'll capitalise on it. So... I think it's just you have to stay sharp and you have, to, you have to cut out your mistakes that maybe you would have got away with in the first division. And what's it like having to play with outfellas like Dean who can't don't have the legs anymore? You threw all the chasing around the middle of the pitch to make up for his inability to get around. No, I'm joking. I'm joking, Dean. Don't kill me. Please come back next week. <laughs> um, no, but you can answer the question, though, if you want. No, look. Look, I've played with Dino now, I think, four years and... I've learned more than I think he knows that I've learned off him. Um, the thing about him is his football knowledge is ridiculous. It's it's his IQ is so high. Um, he's a quiet he's a quiet captain in a way where he does his talking on the pitch way, but he's a leader and I think you need those quiet leaders as well. So he lets me sort of lose my head a bit and he'll keep every, all of us calm and composed. So I think it's he's uh, he's huge for us and you can see it in the games that he's not playing. Yeah, well, sets and terms have been huge for you. I'm just going to make that screen a little bit bigger on his side because that head isn't going to fit in if you keep praising him any longer. Dean, I suppose you've kept a little bit quiet because I suppose it's a bit strange you talking to A about how long for to get on, but I suppose you might have some questions um, about stuff that's not necessarily to do with what's happening in the dressing room this week or, or next week. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to you for a minute or two for a little bit of a chat. Yeah, no, obviously I've been at the club now for a number of years, four or five years, and, and A would be kind of one of the the local boys that, you know, the fans love and the club love having there. But um, from your point of view, A, like what can the club do better in the local area to get more players through? Because I would probably say you're the only one in my time that's really broken through and been a first-team player. There has to be more um, players down there that could potentially break through. So what do you think the club can do? From that side to get more lads like yourself involved and then progressing them through yeah to be honest there is there's very good uh young lads down here skip um i i don't know what it is i don't know if it's from the people down their side down here that they don't have the commitment or they don't want i think the traveling is a big thing for them i know it's uh it's hard to be training in longford when the majority of the squads are from dublin but i think um training has to be facilities in longford to accommodate these people from Longford Club. Uh, I think that's a big thing. I think that's where you would see more people if there was um, facilities. And another thing is obviously with COVID now you can't really do it, but going out to schools and stuff like that more frequently. I know we did it one year and we did it once and that's about it. But if you see people coming out to schools and you see someone like myself from Longford that could do it and they see, they hear about it, I think you get more people out, you know, that sort of way. How important is that, A, eh? because I think we look at some clubs who do a lot of that and it really does, it results in more players down the line, it results in bigger attendances and both of those things bring better revenues uh, in the long term for a club. 
would you have been interested if that such a role was on offer for you in Longford in a in a professional capacity? Because I know it's been advertised uh, in plenty of articles that you're a postman. If the club had approached you and put a, a package together to make that a reality, would that have been something you'd been interested in? Yeah, um, it would have. It would have actually, yeah, because it's not only you get more people out and everything, but you can you can concentrate on football. Like, uh, I do find it very hard in the body sometimes going to work from training and stuff like that. Um, but I feel like it might be more football wise. And so definitely, I remember being in primary school. And I remember Craig Walsh signed for Longford after he did the. Um, Football's next star and the buzz that I brought around the brought around the school like and that was the only time we had someone out, you know, and I think if you had people out every year, twice a year, to do a session or something like that, I think it'd be a huge benefit because I think kids would actually would enjoy that and would actually get an interest in so- in football then, you know, that sort of way. Yeah, the fact that you were in primary school when that after that show happened uh, makes me feel really, really old. <laughs> Like for the likes of yourself, eh, obviously making it into the first team is going to be a big thing for fans. And just kind of what you said there yourself, like you were looking up to a fellow like Craig Walsh and there was a bit of buzz there. Like, um, As far as your own career, do you think you can be that role model for kind of local players and not necessarily just Longford, but kind of the whole Midlands region that people can say, well, hang on a sec, this is a guy that broke through and has made a football career and has made a first team career out of it. Do you see yourself in that role at all? Or are you just kind of saying, no, I'm, a, I'm a young player myself, I'm just focusing on that? Yeah, like I think it comes hand in hand. Um, obviously, people people know you now because you're, you've are broken into the, the local team where you're from and you're playing at the highest level in the country. But at the same time, I'm only 21, so I want to sort of concentrate on my career and say, oh, fair, I, I take it. Um, like, I don't think I make it. A secret that I want to play full time football. So, if if the offer came and it was the right time and stuff like that, maybe yeah. But for now, I'm just I I want to concentrate and see how far I can get in the game. You talk about wanting to play full time football. I know there was a lot of rumor when Neil Fenn went to Cork uh, a couple of years ago that uh, you could be on the the bus with him down to the side. Was there any truth in that? Was that chatted about at the time? Was that an option for you at the time? No. No, I never heard anything. Um, thank God. No, but no, I never heard anything. <laughs> you're going to get me as popular in Cork as you are in that load. Um, you're very outspoken on Twitter. Let's <laughs> talk about that for a moment because you do like to give it as good as you get on Twitter and you reply and you get involved in spats, particularly with the local uh, Midland Derby rivals at Lone. Um, is that just coming from about being a fan of the club as well? That maybe you just you, you almost tweet like you play. It's just I'm gonna I'm all in or I'm not in at all. Um, no, I think that was just a bit of an experience, you know. Uh, I think I was I was young and I, I said some stupid comments, but I sort of had to reel it in. Um, obviously, I don't think I'm the most liked man at loan, but. It's just I never really liked it alone. I know the rivalry isn't there now, but I remember when I was younger going to games. It was it was a huge game, and there was two sets of fans there, and they didn't particularly like each other. So that's where I got it from. But I sort of reeled in the Twitter game now for for the next few years. Is it important to have that rivalry though? Yeah, I think so. Um, obviously the last few years it hasn't been, for whatever circumstances it hasn't been as um. As big as it was, but yeah, I think it is. I think you you get a buzz going into those sort of games, and you 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 don't want you can't lose against them. That's the sort of mindset you have. So I think it's. Bref, I think they're important as well. Like, and I'll just from from my point of view, like obviously coming from Dublin, and I'm not from the area, but seeing the way A was passionate about the games and really fired up for the games, like that fires up our dressing room as well. And I'm sure it'll be the same on the Athlone side as well. Like, and kind of going back to our our previous question like if there is a couple more Longford lads involved and a couple more at Long lads involved and there is more development of those local players those games take even more meaning than in the future like rather than kind of players that are detached from that situation so I think like the likes the likes of A and like we said the way he plays the game and the way he kind of talks about the game off the field really drums up the interest in those type of games and I think 
that's all for the better um, moving forward in the league because that's actually a really big rivalry. Like both both are big clubs in their own right and both have a big catchment area there. So the more we can get interest in, in those particular games, obviously not scheduled this season because of the leagues, but you never know, there could be a cup game. And it's that kind of involvement from local players and fans and volunteers that make those games special. Yeah, and of course, this weekend, you have two games. You played Dundalk and Waterford over the weekend. I suppose this question is to both of you, really, but in terms of those two teams, they're both immediately above you in the, the league table, both with very different seasons, and they both seem to have kind of fallen off a cliff a little bit. Um, how important is it for you to get a result, probably particularly in that Waterford game? I'm not you go, Skip. <laughs> I, th- I thought you were going to do that. Look, um, for us, we have to try and get any result that's available. Like, you know, and the first game is Friday. You have no idea what's going to happen on Friday. You could have injury, suspension, so you can't pick your team for Monday or look at, look forward to Monday. And I know, like, sometimes I have to be cliche on the podcast with you, Breath, like, and just give it the old one game at a time thing. But it really is, like, you know, you, and especially in this league, because... You just don't know what's going to happen. Like you, you don't know. I think Waterford have Rovers. They they could win at Rovers and be on a huge high then coming, you know, into Monday. They could lose and maybe want to pick themselves back up. So we we can't concern ourselves with what's going to happen on Monday night. We've got to try and get some sort of result on Friday. Uh, we're going to be playing a good team with very good players who had a poor result last week. So they're going to be coming into it equally, trying to trying to come back and get some points. So like we can't uh, we can't look forward to Waterford. We've got to try and win or get something on the board on Friday. Uh, no, to be fair, he is right about the cliche. Like you do have to have really thought of Waterford at the minute because we know um, that we need to win games now, and we know that we need to start picking up picking up points. And we have to focus on Dundalk um, because if we take them lightly, we know how good they are on their day. So we we'll focus on Dundalk on Friday, and then we'll turn our attention to Monday. But a genuine question now, and a one-word answer, yes or no, right? Would you swap a heavy defeat in Dundalk for three points against Waterford, given the way the league sits at the moment? No, for me, anyway. Um, no. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very slow no way. Uh, what's been the highlight of the season so far for you, eh, in terms of uh, your input in Longford? Obviously, uh, the win on the opening day against Derry kind of had everyone talking, and you were there thereabouts in the first couple of weeks and it's kind of tailed off results wise since then but what have been the highlights for you of of what's been a tough season for Longford since that opening day victory uh, I think Derry obviously um, just started off so well uh, we were all we were all at it I don't think you could pick out any individual performances that day I think we were all we all knew our job and we were all up for the game but um, it's been a great experience and we've, we still have a great dressing room um, like you know, I know that the results might not say it but We've some quality players in there, and we've we've a quality dressing room, and we've people like Dino and stuff like that to learn off, and we've experience, and we've young players, and it's, I it's it's my I've really enjoyed the experience of being in the dressing room and the challenge as well. You know, you're not you're you're going up against the best players in the country every week, and um, there's no no easy games to say. So I've really enjoyed it, despite the results. Yeah, I suppose my last little one for you. And uh, you just touched on it there, playing against the best players. What's your own kind of personal goals for the rest of the season? Like, regardless of what we're trying to do as a team, like, what do you see as a good season for yourself? Or where do you see, you know, improvement? So by the end of the season, you say, I've gotten much better in these couple of areas or I've done more in these couple of areas. Um, I think consistency, Skipper. Um, I think for the... Barry Derry game, I, I think I started very slow in the league. Uh, I don't know if it was just uh, getting up to speed with it or just the nerves or something like that. Um, but I feel like the last few games I started to start to find my feet. I fired the Derry, the Derry away, where obviously we had to, uh, we had to sacrifice the shape and stuff like that. But just the consistency and making a name for myself in this league and um, having seen what happens next year, you know. Yeah, of course, you are the only player who's played every minute for Longford this season. Um, is that is that kind of one of those things you want to play every week, 90 minutes? And what happens if that board was to go up and 75 or 80 minutes to take you off? Would you be thankful for the rest or a bit disappointed? No, I'd be disappointed. Um, I wanted to do it last year as well, but uh, the, the, suspension, the suspension came in. So 
I've tried to cut out yellows so I could play every minute. I'm not uh, a fella that likes being on the bench when it's going tough or when you play well and come off. I've said it to Dara, I've said it to John that I want to play every minute. So every chance I get, I want to, I want to be on the pitch. Well, that's a big statement for a 21-year-old. I know you are heavily involved in that team and along with Dean and, and a couple of others there, you, you're the lifeblood of that side. But it, for a 21-year-old to come into the, the manager and assistant manager and say, don't even think about taking me off, that takes a kind of special kind of confidence at your age. Yeah, but you wouldn't be saying it like that. But um, you'd be, it, if it comes up in conversation, I think they know, I think they sort of know the character I am and, in fairness, they've, they've uh, handled me very well and they've settled me down a lot and matured me a lot. Um, but I don't, I don't see a point of wanting to play football if you don't want to play every minute. You know, it, it's, it's, it's something that I want to do. I want to play as much minutes and much games as I can. Um, I'm, there, I'm there a while as well. I'm one of the most more experienced players as well. So I have a good relationship with Dara and John. Uh, finally, I suppose, just in terms of, your name has been bandied around a bit. You mentioned you're 21. You're probably aged out at this stage. But um, in terms of international recognition, it hasn't quite happened for you at that level, despite your name getting mentioned by League One fans over the last uh, number of years, under 19 level or whatever it might have been. Is that a disappointment? Do you think maybe uh, if you were from a different part of the country, you might have had a better opportunity at that level? Yeah, it is a disappointment. Look, I think if I was to tell you that I didn't want to, I didn't mind if I wasn't involved in the international squad, I'd be lying to you. Um, obviously, we were in the first division as well, and there was Premier Division players in the in the squad at the time. Um, but I felt I felt like I could have given it a, given it a crack if I if I was up there. But look, it didn't happen, and it's gone now. I'm over age, so I just have to keep pushing on now and see where I go. Yeah, absolutely. To be fair, at the time, I thought you were playing some of the best stuff in, in the league across both divisions. Uh, under 19 level, I think I think the spot actually eventually went to uh, and a kind of a neighbour of yours, Leitrim's Niall Moran, uh, probably went in that spot that you might have been looking at back in the day. Um, it's been great chatting to you. I suppose it's been a tough season, but I think it's been a big learning experience for everybody involved in Longford. And uh, I think you have, you're in a fight, obviously, but I think you have what, what it takes uh, to come out of that on the right side so here's hoping it all works out for you we'll have to put up with this lad anyway for the rest of the season but thanks for joining us eh? pleasure to chat to you as always cheers eh? thanks for you man hey Dervin there of course you know him very well I have to say I love the little bit of respect that's shown there for the role you have in the club uh, just a little skip or skipper like it's thrown out is that something that happens just in general conversation around the club yeah, um, A would be one of the main lads, you know, that, that would say that, like, you know, but uh, playing together a couple of years now as well, like, and playing in midfield, so we've a good partnership and, you know, we've um good relationship as well, like, over the, over the last couple of years and getting to know each other well on and off the pitch as well. So, you know, respect from both ways, um, you know, playing together, you know, brings that and brings a bit of camaraderie as well. What do the lads who don't like you call you? Can you share that in the podcast? <laughs> Everyone likes me. <laughs> Good answer. I like it. I like it. Listen, plenty of things to talk about. We're going to talk about a couple of the cup draws. Uh, the FAI Cup, obviously, the what used to be the first round, now been dubbed the qualifying round. It's where the, the junior and intermediate sides enter the competition for the most part. Uh, six games drawn the other day. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But first, the European draws took place this week. Uh, Longford got a UA for license, but unfortunately they're not in the competition. Uh, there are four clubs who have been waiting for this moment since last uh, November, December, when they qualified. Uh, Bohemians, Dundalk and Sligo Rovers will face opposition in the new look Europa Conference. Uh, more on that a little bit later. But uh, Shamrock Rovers will be Ireland's representative in the Champions League. And they've been handed a fairly tough task. Now, it has slightly changed with the advent of the third tier, um, that conference league that we talked about. It's a little bit harder to get through rounds in Europe. Stephen Bradley's side, they were drawn against the Slovakian side, Slovan Bratislava, in the first round game. Uh, that happened on Monday and then earlier, uh, sorry, on Tuesday. And then earlier on Wednesday, uh, the second round draw was done and they could be facing the trip to Young Boys of Bern in Switzerland if they get through that. That's a fairly tight set of fixtures uh, to get to, into those playoffs for that Champions League uh, opportunity. It's it's a tough, tough ask for Stephen Bradley's side. Yeah, they're, they are difficult games, but 
you know, you're trying to make your way in the Champions League here. So you're expecting difficult ties. No matter where you go, no matter who's drawn out of hat, it's going to be a difficult game. Um, Rovers have done really well over the last couple of years. And I think Stephen has built the team and prepared the team to try and make a crack at Europe. It's, it's kind of the final frontier for a lot of, you know, League of Ireland clubs. And we're trying to be uh, consistent even if it's not every year in the Champions League or every year in the Europa League group stages, you're trying to make, you know, into those ladder rounds uh, on a consistent basis. So, like, they're geared up for this and this is what they've set up for. So, I'm sure they're relishing the task. I'm sure the lads want to get going and cracking on those games as much as possible. And, you know, it's probably maybe a little bit better that there is a little bit of a name recognition with the with the club you're facing. You know, it'll give the lads, you know, a little bit more... Um, you know, confidence that they can go and get a result or, or belief, you know, in themselves that if they can knock them off, they can they can make their way through to, you know, further in the in the round or possibly even dream of getting into that, that group stage further down the line. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, a victory for Shamrock Rovers in that first round game against Bratislava would give them a minimum of six more games. They'd be, uh, they'd work their way from the Champions League. Of course, that tie with young um Sorry, with the, with the Swiss Swiss team, the young boys, and then they would move into the Europa League. And if they progress in the Europa League, brilliant. If they don't, they would fall into the Conference League. So plenty of football in Europe if Shamrock Rovers can get through that. If they fail to get through the first game, they would drop straight into the second round of the Europa Conference, which is a, a harder path to get into group stages. So all important Huge money on the line, of course, as we know. In terms of the Europa Conference as well, three Irish teams in action there. Two of them, they could be sharing a plane to Iceland. They both play on the same night in Iceland uh, against Icelandic um, opposition Bohemians and Sligo Rovers, both playing in Iceland. Uh, do you want to take a chance at pronouncing the names? Because I sure as hell don't. Uh, either Good Johnson, is it? <laughs> Yeah, good enough, good enough. Uh, no, I, I have a stab at it just for uh, for the respect, I suppose, of those clubs. Uh, Hafnar Fjordur are Sligo's opponents. Apologies if I've butchered the name. Uh, while uh, Bohemians will visit... So, so it looks like St. Yard, Yard Nan. I've absolutely butchered that. S-T-J-A-R-N-A-N. Uh, if they get through that, Bohemians will face Dudelange. Of course, they played UCD many, many moons ago during UCD's European Odyssey uh, in the Intertoto Cup and, and back in the day. Uh, Sligo Rovers, uh, they will face Rosenberg in the uh, second round of the conference if they were to get through there. Dundalk, of course, they're also in action. No Icelandic adventure for them, but they have a trip to Wales to get ready for uh, a little bit easier logistically to get. Of course, no way fans allowed to travel so Clubs will be missing out on that support, will be missed, and fans, of course, will miss out on that opportunity to be at these uh, fantastic opportunities to witness European football. Home sides do get to have fans to some degree, but it will, of course, depend on the uh, restrictions at that time. But the way things are going, things are beginning to open up as vaccinations and, and all of that starts to, to kick in. So we have hopefully have brighter days ahead and bigger crowds ahead. Dundalk, they face Newtown of Wales in the first round, and a victory there would see them clash with. Lavadia, Talon of Estonia, or Gibraltar's St. Joseph. And I suppose uh, we'd have to expect Lavadia Talon to come through that based on purely name recognition and reputation, but that does stand for something at this level. Yeah, I think um, they probably, all three, have a chance of winning that, those first round ties. And uh, I have a little, people in Iceland probably won't like me, but I have a little bugbear with Icelandic teams being better than us. Like, I think... We obviously talk about our standard and our level and, and it should be better and we should be aiming for higher. But I think we should be going to, to Iceland and, and winning games and beating their, their representatives, you know, not just, you know, willy-nilly going and beating them. Like, obviously, they've got good players and good teams. But if you look at their sport and structure, their population size and theirs, we should be able to, you know, put it up to these teams and expect to beat these teams and go into the next round. Whereas I think at the moment, it's still a 50-50 toss-up. But... I think those the, the two clubs facing the Icelandic teams will fancy their chances. And then I would expect Dundalk, but we don't know what to expect from them really. But I would expect them to get through that that first round. And that would be really important for them this year with very little league campaign to, to fight for. So hopefully the three teams can get through. But I think they should all be targeting wins in the first round anyway. 
Yeah, so here's hoping that is a possibility for all three sides. Uh, I'd like to see all three sides coming through. I think Dundalk need it, really, because uh, there's not much else positive happening around the club at the moment. Uh, they'll be looking for that little bit of a boost to give them something to cling on to as the season progresses. Bohemians, they'll probably need just a little bit of a boost as well. There'll be some disappointment with how their season has gone and where they find themselves. Uh, Sligo Rovers, they're really hard to beat. They're just really, really tough to score against. And I think if they have a full side going to Iceland, uh, I see them coming back with a win. And I think they could even give Rosenberg. Uh, they're not what they were 10 or 15 years ago. I think Sligo could actually have a good run in that European conference if they can keep everybody fit and available for selection. And um, there is, of course, a little bit closer to home, something that you'll be interested in when it comes to the first round proper in a few weeks' time is the FAI Cup and the first round, uh, the qualifying round, as it's called now. That has been confirmed the fixture. Six games with 12 teams taking part, six intermediate and junior sides getting buys to the first round proper as well, where they'll be joined by the 20 sides with the six winners, makes a round of 32, and they will, of course, play it through the five rounds to get to the FAI Cup final that we all know and love. And Dean, maybe you might be there later in the summer or not in the summer, it'll be November or December by the time it rolls around this season. Um, but we'll run through the quick fixtures quickly. Minute University Town uh, versus Bonnie Gee, Kilna Manor versus Home Farm, Fairview Rangers versus Athen Rye FC, Ring Mahan Rangers versus Crumlin United, Oliver Bond Celtic versus Colester Donny Kearney, St. Moctis versus Mock Hill Celtic, Cockhill Celtic, and then the boys are Malahide United, Bangor, St. Kevin's Boys, College Corinthians, Liffey Wanderers, and Usher Celtic. Now, I know you know some of these teams uh, because they have players that have played in the league before, and I know because I was at it a couple of years ago, you played some of these teams in League Cup games. I know Cockhill Celtic were visitors to uh, what was then City Calling Stadium uh, a couple of years ago. You beat them in the, the first or second round of the, the League Cup. So, um. What is the standard like? Because I don't think it, the gap is as big as maybe people think in certain cases between these intermediate sides, particularly and the uh, the first the first division mainly of the of the league of Ireland. Yeah, I think like the clubs you mentioned would be quite quite well known. They'd be the highest level kind of junior clubs in the country, and routinely would be in that first round or or you know that that period or that game that gets into the first round. They'd be in and around that all the time, winning. Junior Cups winning Leinster Senior Leagues and Munster Senior Leagues and that. So um, the standard is not a huge amount different, I suppose. It's, it's usually a dedication kind of thing, maybe three or four nights training rather than, you know, two uh, at the junior level. Um, sometimes it's just a time commitment thing. Like there's lads that are more than capable and more than good enough to play, but, you know, from work or family reasons, just don't have the time time to give. And Usually over the course of a whole season, that will tell significantly. But on on a particular game, an FAI Cup game, it might not be all that significant because you know these lads will maybe take time off work or prepare for that game more intensely, like the way the league clubs would for every game. So uh, there's not a huge difference uh, at certain times. I think over the course of a season, like I said, it's bigger. But in an in each individual game, um, there's not as much a, a difference as people might think there is. Of course, some of those teams have been in the league before. Home Farm are in there as well. They were in the League of Ireland for many, many years. Kilna Manor, their opponents in that round or the qualifying round, uh, there's a huge League of Ireland influence there at the moment. I know former Dublin City, Sligo Rovers, I think also played, spent a bit of time with Pat's Chris Foy, not Chris Foy, he's a cyclist, Keith Foy, uh, of course, uh, one of the members of that Irish team that won a European Championship with Brian Kerr. Uh, it's almost 25 maybe years ago now. Uh, but Great talent, but he's a fairly big League of Ireland presence in his squad as well. Yeah, a number of League of Ireland players there um, over the last couple of years. Lads that had finished up playing League of Ireland level and went to play Kilmana. And I know they had a couple of uh, good seasons under their belt there as well. Like, and very much deserve to be in the position they're in. And, and like I said, maybe those lads are not uh, able to commit the time to play League of Ireland football anymore, but they can play on that, those individual occasions. So anyone that draws them will f face a, a tough test against, you know, several ex League of Ireland players. And I'm sure, you know, what are willing lads that they have in their squad as well. Now, I suppose from your point of view, six winners, six buys will go into the hat, open draw. You'll be in it as well uh, with your, slag, or I would call just like Rose, with your Longford Town uh, hat on. Would you have a preferred option in the first round of the cup? Do you want to get maybe one of these junior sides for a perceived weaker opposition, or do you want to get 
the top names and really take a scalp yourselves or or how does that work in, in your world? Because I know you came very close to, to beating Cork last year. It was the late uh, Ricardo Denanga goal, I think, that deprived G either it was late in injury time, hundred the ninety seventh minute, or was it late in the extra time? Extra time, um, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, um what, what's your, your take on that? Do you want the joint killer opportunity yourself, maybe of a Shamrock Rovers, or do you want to play a let's pick a St. Moctis or a, a one of those uh, perceived smaller clubs? Yeah, I think from from my point of view, I've never really given too much thought to the draw. You just kind of wait to see who you get, and then you know you play it on that particular merit, like whether it's one of the junior clubs, whether it's a first division team, whether it's one of the the giants so to speak, like, you know, because you could take any of those roles, like if we were playing Shamrock Rovers, we'd be huge underdogs, if we were playing one of the junior teams, they'd be the underdogs and we'd be the favourites, so I generally don't give a huge, um, you know, time to wondering who we might get or who we want to get, I think you generally look at it and say, you only need to win four games, five games to get, you know, to get to where you want to go in the cup competition, so you kind of go into it saying, why not us? You're going to have to beat someone eventually, so it doesn't matter who it is that you get drawn against. You just want... I think I suppose the thing I would look for is maybe you get a home draw. That's the only thing that I would kind of be... Uh, hopefully, we get a home draw. Like cause It doesn't matter who you bring there. If it's if it's one of the underdogs, you'd be expecting to go and beat them. If it's one of the bigger teams, you'd say that's probably your best chance of beating them. So that's probably the only thing I really look for in, in the draw. And then, you know, looking to say if we get a couple of decent enough draws, you might go, go far or go all the way. Like Angford did a, a couple of times at the start of the century. Like, yeah, how much is made of that in Longford? Because I know it's a huge part of your history, but on a match night, it doesn't really feel sometimes like you're walking into the home of a of a team that's won the FAI Cup. Like you go to other clubs, whether it's Bowes with their murals or Sligo with their outdoor museum, and, and there's other examples of it across the country. But in Longford, it doesn't quite seem to have that kind of pride of place, at least in the public areas of the of the ground. Yeah, I think they've um, they've a couple of kind of, um, I don't know if you'd call it a shrine, but just kind of uh, bits and pieces in the in the bar area with the you know the newspaper clippings and some jerseys and stuff relating back to the to the time they won the cups. Um, but yeah, it's not a huge in your face thing. I don't think like you know, and maybe they're just a little bit humble about it, modest about it. I don't know, like you know that they're not kind of banging it in people's face like it's twenty odd years ago now, give or take, like you know, so. Um, I'm not sure from the club's perspective if it's something that they, they want to be loud about right now, like in this day and age, or whether it's just something that they're quietly like respectful of and they have their, their few bits and pieces in the bar. Like Maybe it is something that the club could look to kind of commemorate more on the outside of the ground or, or whatever the case may be, but um, that would be a club decision, not, not a player's decision. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let's start with the first division. Of course, we didn't actually run through the results of last weekend. Just for the record, last weekend's games, all games played Friday evening. Galway United won at Lone Town nil. They left it late, but they secured the, the win in the end. Cork City, Cavantili, a 2 0 win for Cavantili. Piles more misery onto the Lee Siders. Cavantili, uh, very happy with that result, I would imagine. UCD won. Cove Ramblers, two. Great result for Ramblers in Belfield. Wexford and Treaty 1-2 to the Shannon Siders, while Bray and Shells. Shells really look to be the team to beat 4-1 in the end, the result there for them at the Carlisle grounds. It's been a disappointing year for Bray. They're languishing in the bottom half of the table, but Shells look like they're eight points clear. I know we're not even at the halfway stage of the season yet. It's very early to be a call in the leagues, but it's very hard to see anybody catch. They made New City look like they challenged, but they've tailed off when they enter that exam period that they're renowned for kind of struggling through. Um, can you see anyone catching shells? No, not really. Like, um, I think at the start it was not, I wouldn't even say shaky, just a couple of draws and a couple of wins and it wasn't quite moving with, you know, a lot of freedom. But last couple of weeks, they're just kind of blowing teams away. They're really putting a stamp on and saying, we're the best team in the league and we're going to stride ahead here now and make it comfortable for ourselves. And I expect them to keep winning keep making that gap bigger and, and be comfortable winners in the end but um from second down to seventh or eighth i think it is that's going to be a huge scrap for playoff places i think you can throw cork in there as well in ninth because they're really only uh, seven spots off fifth place seven points off fifth place that's 
a couple of a good run and you're bang up in there because teams haven't dropping points left, right, and center. But you've ten points separating second and second last in that yeah. division, and four of them are going to qualify for the playoffs. Uh, the first division really is where most of the action is over the next few months, and I think it's going to be exciting. I've been really impressed with Treaty, really impressed with UCD, Cavatelli and Athlone in parts have been impressive. Galway look to be getting their thing together as well at the moment, uh, and they seem to be grinding out results now. Those late goals uh, feature of any decent title run or promotion run, and um, they've kind of found that little knack as well. And John Caulfield has to kind of drill that into them. Um, it's going to be you can't run off Bray Cove coming back into it. Cork, well, it's been a poor season. You never know. A couple of wins, they could be back in the hunt. So the first division is where it is. Shells, of course, they're in action. They host Wexford. No, they don't. They travel to Wexford on, uh, on at the weekend on Friday night. Um, that's going to be a bit of a, a mismatch. Wexford have been struggling three points from their 11 games so far. But everything else, Bray and local derby against UCD, Galway host Cavatelli, at Lone Town host Cork, while Treaty United make the trip south to Cove. So um, anything there catch your eye? Any of those games, I suppose, your neck of the woods, Bray and UCD maybe? Would that yeah, be I was going to say Bray and UCD. Um... Bray, I expected to, to be doing better and I think they had turned the corner a little bit but then just a little slip again um, I'm sure Gaz is looking and saying look we can we can still make a, a, a surge into, into playoff spots so they won't be panicking just yet uh, UCD as we said good players, free scoring but just hit a little bit of a sticky patch and we'll be expecting to get back into it now as well but um, that'll be the, the pick of the games I think and for me Cabin TV because Cabin Teeley are the first division for me. They've won six, they've lost five. They're just, it's just crazy. Like it's mad every week with them. You think they're going to win, they get beaten two or three nil. You think they're going to, you know, lose and they go and win three one or something. Like it's just, they're the epitome, I think, of the league. And they're, they're sitting bang in the middle, for, probably for that reason. Like, you know, but um, it's unusual that a team doesn't have any draws, uh, even in a league that we're talking about being inconsistent and people dropping points and they still don't have draws. So, you know, just watch Cabin TV. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Definitely entertaining. Uh, we won't get too in-depth into your own game with Dundalk. Obviously, you're hoping for a win in that and a good performance to boot. Uh, Dundalk have been patchy. Still nobody in the dugout for them on a long-term basis. So much innuendo and suggestion and rumours circulating, whether it's going to be Dave Rogers, whether it's going to be Jimmy Jilton with Dave Rogers, whether it's going to be Vinnie Perth making the most unlikely return to the League of Ireland I think I've ever seen. Uh, and there's been some stories over the years of people coming back to roles, uh, how you can be sacked last year and then be brought back the following year. I, I just don't see the ego that appears to be uh, in, encapsulated in the, in the chairman making a decision to say, I made a mistake, please come back in. I just can't see that happening. Um, you'd know Vinny, I suppose, a little bit better. Maybe he might have left Langford by the time he'd moved in, probably. But uh, he has been around. Uh, flat, or I was going to call it Flank Care again. My names are all in the past. Uh, Bishopsgate. Um, you used to be, I'd see him at games last year or whatever, but it's it's not last year, the year before. But it, it's been, you'd know him from around the, the games. Can you see that happening? Is that realistic? I would have said no, but it's done dark, so. Uh, who knows yeah. conversation over on that one uh, yeah. moving back towards the, the fixtures uh, you, you played Dundalk who knows who will be in the dugout for them who knows who will be on the pitch for them as it uh, transpires on uh, Friday night Pats and Sligo uh, a good team uh, Pats obviously Ronald Coughlin still part of that team uh, has impressed got the score sheet last week has been relatively quiet though in recent weeks they'll be hosting Sligo they'll be looking to kind of regain a bit of power in that struggle for that second place spot at the moment uh, presuming, of course, that Sean Rovers also win. They take the trip down to Waterford. Can you see anything other than a Rovers victory in that game? Um, the only thing is they're on a little bit of a bounce with the new manager. Got a good result last week. Um, Rovers through. So, you know, Mark Bairstrom's probably saying, like, why can't we get a result this week? And, you know, leave it up to the players to kind of, you know, pull off another another result. And maybe they've got a bit of confidence and a bit of momentum. And, you know, um, Rovers on the on the long journey down to Waterford. Maybe they can catch them out a little bit. Maybe they can get a point. I don't know. You just you wouldn't know. But um, you'd expect Rovers to win and come through. But anything can happen in this league. As as we seen last week, the Waterford winning the talk was a shock. So it wouldn't be a shock if they got anything uh, something out of the Rovers game. 
Bowes, uh, they host Drogheda at Dalemount Park. Of course, a very entertaining one-all draw the last time they played. That Dawson Devoy goal uh, setting up for, for Liam Burt to score was probably the highlight of that game, but it was a cracker. Two very entertaining sides when they're on form. That could be probably the, the most-watched game of the weekend. Yeah, I expect that to be really competitive. And, um, you know, Bowes have stopped start a little bit. And they'll want to kind of probably claim that place where where Jod are climb into those kind of room four places. So um, that would be a good test for them of where they're at. And um, you know, Tim and Kev, they have done a great job at Jod. They're going to say, look, we want to be here at the end of the season now, and we want to you know keep pushing forward. So this will be a good challenge for them. Can they hold off a challenge with a team like Bowes, who are expected to be ahead of them, and can they stay up up in those positions? So like you said, that, that could be the, the game to watch more closely because both teams will probably go for that one and both teams will want to will want to win that for their own reasons. Yeah, separated by four points in the league table at the moment, but currently sitting in fourth and fifth. Uh, one game I kind of skipped over it there was that game between Pats and Sligo. Uh, three points between them, second and third in the table at the moment. Pats will want to win that to, to leapfrog Sligo and put themselves in contention for that league title hunt again. Yeah, absolutely, and they're coming back home now, having played us away last week and winning, and uh, they'll definitely be looking for for three points there and to make a little bit of a statement that they can leap for Abs- leap leap for Abs- Sligo and go and challenge Rovers kind of more consistently in the second part of the season. But um, you know, good games really all over the place. Uh, good teams there, both of them. Like so, that, that, expect that to be a good game and. You never know. Um, Sligo get a couple of players back. They might fancy their chances of pinching result and, and keeping that their status there at the top of the table. Yeah, Richmond has been a quite a happy hunting ground for Sligo in recent seasons. So we'll see what happens there. Another situation, the final game in the Premier Division this weekend, or this Friday night at least, there was of course around the games on Monday. Uh, Finn Harps and Derry. Derry could leapfrog Finn Harps with a win here. Uh, currently sitting sixth and seventh in the table, 19 points, 18 points. A very level pegging, of course. Finn Harps had that win in the Brandywell a couple of weeks ago, their first ever league win in the Brandywell. Um, they're going to be really happy, and, and with the result in Tala last week, can Finn Harps build on this little bit of a bounce that they've got going? Can they take another scalp off Jerry? Yeah, I think, like, I always like this game because of football in that area is, is really, really good, like, you know, and that, it's great to have a, two good teams in this rivalry, you know. Um, always makes for a good game. I, I don't see why they can't win it, but um, Derry have actually looked really strong since Rory's come in. So I'd expect Rory to be ex- saying we need something from this game, and and he probably would say out to say, look, they're ahead of us. Let's go rein them in now, you know. So that would be the motivation for Derry. But um, you just can't write off all these teams because at the, the very time where you say, okay, now they're slipping back down the table, they bang and they'll get a result somewhere. They weren't expected to get out in last week, and they got a point. So you know, why can't they take all three at home this week to Derry? But again, that, that's a good one. It's another good game, like I said, and expect it to be very, very competitive and definitely a good one to tune into if you're, if you're looking for a game to watch. Monday, of course, is a full set of fixtures in the league. And um, we've given out on this show and in, across other places about the, the crazy fixtures. You can see teams traveling all over the country on a Monday night with part-time players, it can be a bit of a disaster. But thankfully, the fixtures computer has thrown up, for the most part, local derbies on Monday night. We will, of course, see the Louth derby between Drada and Dundalk. Bowes and Shamrock Rovers will take part in what I suppose has become the traditional Dublin derby. And Sligo Rovers and Derry City do battle in the Brandywell uh, in the Northwest derby. But they've sent Waterford the whole way to Longford. Uh, that's got to be a bit of a kick in the teeth for Waterford uh, to uh, to have to make that journey on a Monday night. Uh, and finally, I suppose Harps, they also have to travel to Dublin. They play St. Patrick's Athletic. But it just seems so difficult on a Monday night to be making those really long journeys. How do you find them as a player? I uh, always found them really difficult, having played on a Friday and then playing on a Monday. And like you said, there's so much that goes into it for you know, the part-time players, it's getting time off work Friday and Monday to go to the game. So, like, you know, you don't often have a lot of accommodating bosses that will let you leave early two days in a row, Fridays and Mondays. Like, Monday's usually the start of a work week. And Friday's the end of a work week where you could be busy. You never know. So, that's always difficult from that point of view. Then recovery times and training times in between can be can be difficult as well. So, 
yeah, they are difficult fixtures. I think for years people have called for the league to be extended a little bit and, you know, the break not to be as long in the middle of the season or sorry, in the off season and to eradicate some of these fixtures. But like you said, maybe they've listened a little bit, but uh, Ollie Horgan will be saying they haven't listened at all because they're sending him down to, to Richmond Park on a Monday night, like, you know, and he probably feels hard done by because some of the other games are closer by. But, you know, maybe maybe they're trying their best, you know, if, if there's a double fixture later on the season, maybe maybe Harps are at home on a Monday night or whatever the case may be. But you can't please everybody with the fixture list. I know that, but it does make it um, extremely difficult for the part-time teams. And it is tilted in the favour of the full-time teams to have those games on Monday nights. Well, I think they have to be fitted in somewhere to be fair to everybody involved in that process. Um, there's not enough weeks to get them all in on Fridays and Saturday nights, so yeah. they got to fit in somewhere. And I suppose geography is going to be the big decider in that. In terms of those actual games, I know you'll be playing at 7.45 on Monday night, but for the neutral who might be looking for a game to pick up, uh, anything... Anything past the, the Bose Shamrock Rovers one, it's the traditional one. It catches everyone's attention. Um, would that be the one you'd be picking if you were not playing on Monday night yourself? Yeah, I would. I'd watch that one again. Like I think I said that earlier in the season when it cropped up and it ended up being a really good game um, out in Tala. So, yeah, I, I think that's just the obvious one. It's no point complicating it. The only other one that would really kind of take me eyes maybe Drada and Dundalk because Drada are doing so well and Dundalk are doing so poorly and you might actually expect Drada to win that one now so that could be the other one that kind of takes your eye if uh, if you weren't a Bowes or Rovers fan or didn't want to watch them Yeah, Drada of course uh, beaten by Dundalk earlier in the year uh, 2-1 when they met in Oriel um, I think it's going to be a different kettle of fish this time around I think Dundalk have, have fallen away since then and I think Drada have really stepped up in the last few weeks. So I think those two are probably the, the highlights of the weekend, but you know, we'll find out on Monday when the second round of fixtures this weekend takes place. Dean, thanks as always. It's been a pleasure to Aid Irvin who joined us earlier in the show. Uh, thank you today as well. Uh, two fantastic midfield players uh, holding the middle of midfield there for uh, Longford Town this season and hopefully results pick up uh, the best luck to you over the weekend. Particularly, I asked you a bit of a stumpler question earlier about whether you take defeat against Drada for a guaranteed three points in Waterford. I still think that's the sensible thing to do. Not to go out to lose in the dog, but to focus on Waterford. I know you gave me the cliches earlier, but we'll see how I've never, I've never accept taking a loss, Brev. Never. Good to hear it. Good to hear it. I'm sure the FAI would be glad to hear that as well. We have too much of that crack going on over the years. Uh, listen, thank you so much uh, for joining us again this week. As always, a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to let you go off. Again, that football tournament that's happening on the TV somewhere, go check that out. And uh, we'll be chatting to you again next week or maybe two weeks' time uh, on the show. Dean, thanks. It's been a pleasure as always. Thanks, Ralph.